a new Australian film is uh, releasing August 18th in uh, cinemas, a film called Girl at the Window. And it's my great pleasure to be speaking again to the director of Girl at the Window, Mark Hartley. Mark, welcome to Movie Metropolis. Thanks so much, Pear. Always good to talk to you. And I'm, I'm intrigued about the process that uh, you took to be involved in this film. The process, um, well, uh, I'd worked with Tony Ganane, the producer before, and we've been working on another project after Patrick, which was a much bigger project. And it was proving very, very difficult to get financed. And, you know, you can only spend so many years on a project and then suddenly realise, my goodness, how long ago was it I made my last film? So um, I just said to Tony, let's just find something a lot simpler that we can try to get finance and just actually, you know, get back onto a set. And he had a script called Eyes, uh, is what it was called at that point. And um, it was something that we figured we could sort of make uh, you know, quite modestly. And that's where it all began. Okay. And it's a really effective thriller uh, and shot in Victoria. I, it looked, uh, some of the uh, environment uh, looked familiar. Was it Ballarat, Bendigo sort of area? There are a few, yeah, look, uh, Gary, the DOP and I went away and did some cutaways for a couple of nights in Bendigo and Ballarat. But um, that was the only stuff actually shot out of the CBD. Everything else is shot uh, within, I think Werribee's the furthest place we went to, to to shoot the rest of the film uh -huh, how interesting now the screenplay by uh terence hammond and uh, nicolette minster uh, is such an intricate um sort of uh, thriller how much did you work with them uh while or before or even while you were filming oh we didn't do anything while we were filming literally it was it was very much locked off but prior to that yeah um the, as i say the first script is called eyes i came on board and um there was a whole backstory there about the killer which i figured we didn't really need so we sort of jettisoned that and then literally the budget dictated the rest um uh when we knew how much we literally had to make the film it, it was kind of okay do we make this bigger film badly or do we sort of compress it down and make a film that we know we can achieve and so we took out a lot of stuff that was set in a hospital. There was like ambulance chases, all that stuff. And we kind of focused it more around the two houses side by side. And um, yeah, and I think that worked to our advantage. Then, then Nicolette came in because um, certainly I wasn't uh, the right age uh, and Terence wasn't to really give the teenagers dialogue that sounded, uh, you know, legitimate. And uh, Nicolette came in and sort of... Um, reworked uh, the kids so that they sounded uh, like they weren't in a movie, like they sounded like they're in real life. Well, that works quite effectively, actually. And um, uh, there's some very naturalistic performances, uh, including, uh, of course, Rada Mitchell, and she's uh, quite a good get, I thought. Yeah, no, it, was, it was great to get Rada. I, obviously, I mean, Rada certainly, apart from the fact that it's always good to work with very experienced professional actors. Uh, she was great because you really did believe that her and uh, Ella were mother and daughter, but also she certainly helped um, us raise the finance, um, you know, selling off international territories because of her profile. So yeah, it was great that we could do that and still have an Australian actress in the film as well. Yes, exactly. And of course we should mention Vince Colosimo and Andreas Gilbert and, uh, uh, and a few others, James Mackay. You, you've got a really interesting cast there. Yeah, Simone Buchanan, uh, it, it, it's, yeah, we were really lucky. Um, which we shot during lockdown in Melbourne. Um, so, you know, we, we couldn't bring anyone in from anywhere apart from Melbourne actors. And uh, we, were, we were really lucky with the cast that we got. That's so interesting, shooting during lockdown. And I've spoken to so many filmmakers. There are obviously some real challenges in uh, filmmaking during that time. Yeah, look, it's um, it's certainly not fun, that's for sure. Um, yeah, look, you're making films, making modest films on limited budgets, you know, on on on, on limited schedules, is uh, is is tough at the best of times when everything's working in your favour, and certainly during knock during lockdown and during you know a, a pandemic. More to the point, um, nothing's working in your favour, and we were just, we were just really lucky that no one on our on our crew caught COVID because if anyone had of during our 19-day our shoot, 
um, we would have been shut down. And I, I doubt we would have got back up again because we only had RADA for a limited window of time. Wow, what a process. And uh, I mean, it's so intricately shot and uh, so carefully uh, edited as well. Um, can you talk through that process of the way that you shot it and how many cameras you use, that sort of thing? Yeah, look, we are, we, I, I only do single camera coverage. Um, Gary Richards, my cinematographer, and I have worked together for 30 years now, which seems almost unbelievable. So look, we, we have a very shorthand approach on set. Um, we also get together and we neither of us can draw, unfortunately, but we shot list everything within an inch of its life. And our shot lists are more like edit lists in a way. And so we know exactly what we need to do when we get on set. And um, obviously we also know how much time we've got to shoot stuff. So we know what we need to lose amongst our shot list. So things are very, very planned. And, um, and I, I made a point on this film saying to the cast, look, we've got so much we really want to shoot um that if i get it in the first take and i'm happy i'm moving on so be prepared to give it your all and let's not think that you know you're going to find your feet take 30 um because that's not going to be possible and i and you know i think they all liked the fact that we were moving so fast and furious but we were moving fast and furious in a very traditional way shooting everything on dollies and tracks and lighting everything uh you know to look like uh uh a, th a throwback kind of feature rather than your sort of very naturalistic style that's very prevalent today. Uh -huh. Okay. Well, well done on that. And it, uh, it really worked out quite effectively. Uh, and uh, I was interested to see some of the, the stunt work in the film, etc. cetera, that uh, must've been interesting. <laughs> yeah. I th there's, there's not a lot of stunt work. I mean, most, I think there's only, there's a roll down a hill and a, and a couple of hits, but everything else the actors did themselves, particularly ah. that final, the final big confrontational fight scene uh, in the in the garage. Most of that is is the two cast members um, having been trained for a day by the stunt coordinator. Yeah, and there certainly are some very very tough scenes for uh, some of the uh, actors as well, which uh, must have been uh, a little difficult for them, perhaps at times. Uh, well, there was a, there was a few prosthetics which were certainly uncomfortable to wear. And, uh, you know, being in it day after day, uh, I'm sure I didn't have to go through it, but I certainly wouldn't have wanted to. But no, I think everyone, look, look, it's funny when you're working during a pandemic and in lockdown as well, you've, you know, you feel so blessed just to be able to get in a car, drive to a film shoot and actually achieve something. And I think that was kind of, everyone was so, you know, happy to be working and, um, and achieving something during, during a lockdown that, you know, I kind of, the enthusiasm, you know, overtook any hardships. <laughs> That's great to hear. And I also was intrigued by the use of music uh, in the film. You obviously chose that carefully. Yeah, Jamie Blanks, who did the score, um, is a very, very famous filmmaker in his own right, um, but also is a very old and good friend of mine. And he'd scored a couple of my documentaries. And um, like Gary with Jamie, I just have a shorthand when it comes to music with him. You know, we talk about composers all the time and we wanted a score that sounded like a, a kind of rollicking Amblin style 80s score that could then turn quite um, uh, suspenseful and dark when it needed to. And uh, Jamie did an amazing job. I mean, it's wall to wall music. I think the film runs for 85 minutes and there's 76 minutes of music in the film. So he, he did an incredible job, I thought. It's good to see a thriller being made in Australia. We don't often make uh, genre films or thriller films like this. Um, I mean, is there a reason why we don't do this as much as we should? Uh, well, look, I assume it all comes down to finance. I mean, we certainly weren't supported by Screen Australia on this, who really didn't like the project. Yeah. So maybe that's part of the reason. I really don't know. I mean, I, maybe there's not a lot of filmmakers who have an interest in making these films like myself. That could be part of it too. We we seem to make you know very uh, different styles of films to genre films, and look, I think this is a very uh, like a curio in terms of a genre film. Anyway, um, looking at genre films today, certainly when I go to genre film festivals and so forth, they're either uh, incredibly artistic or they're very extreme, and this film fits very much in the middle of that. It's you know much more of a 
a throwback to a you know kind of as I said like our, my um my pitch to everyone was let's make an an Amblin movie directed by Toby Hooper. <laughs> And I think when when you hear when you sort of know that the film makes a lot more sense. <laughs> I like that. That's a it's a really great. And look, and because it does fit in the model in the middle of those either you know arty or extreme, I think it kind of also will appeal to people who don't necessarily seek out horrors or thrillers. Yes. Yes. No. I, I can see the the sort of niche perhaps to some extent that uh, the film. Um, is part of and as you're saying you're looking at overseas sales and so on because I can see this uh, uh, being um, you know quite attractive to uh, overseas territories US etc yeah look we've been really lucky I think it's sold to uh, you know basically I think there's only a couple of territories still to go that haven't been sold so um, you know there certainly is a market for these kinds of films and look because it isn't extreme it means that it can kind of play in television markets and sort of, you know, almost be like an elevated lifestyle movie in certain um, territories as well. Yes. And I suppose with streaming services, the way they've developed, incredibly developed, um, there's always opportunities for films like this to uh, get a good run. Yeah, look, I, I really don't know about that kind of stuff. But, um, but yeah, all, all I know is that the, um, that the American sales agent has been very, very happy with the response to the film. Okay. You've made so many interesting films. I mean, not quite Hollywood, of course, Patrick, as, as you mentioned, and, uh, and other films. What's your decision-making process about what you decide to uh, helm? Uh, ultimately, I just like to make films that I'd like to see. You know, um, we, we certainly would not quite Hollywood. I just thought if no one else, I mean, if I don't make it, then it'll never get made. So that was sort of the reasoning behind that. With Patrick, it was, it was I, you know, I really wanted to establish myself as a narrative filmmaker. And Tony was the one who gave me the opportunity with that film. And it, with Patrick, it was all about trying to make a film where we could sort of put our own stamp on it. So it was its own beast and not just a slavish remake. And, um, and with this film, once again, it was like, um, with Patrick, we borrowed lots of, uh, callbacks from other filmmakers and here I think you know Gary and I have tried to find our own style to some degree and uh and I think I think our own style is sort of yeah is coming to the fore in Girl at the Window. Oh absolutely yeah no that no, works very well uh, so tell me uh, Mark are you working on other projects at the moment? Yeah look uh there's a couple of there's a couple of other documentary projects I've been working on for quite a while and uh, certainly another a couple of other narrative films that we've, you know, these things take so long and you never, it's always the most unlikely film that gets up. Um, for a long time, I honestly thought Girl at the Window was dead in the water and suddenly Tony rings and says, we've got film Vic Marnie, we can make this work. Let's, let's, you know, let's do it. So you never know what the next project is that actually is going to, to find the finance. That's uh, very interesting and very true. I speak to so many filmmakers with the same sorts of issues. So where are we headed in terms of the uh, Australian film industry? I suppose that's a uh, Dorothy Dixon that's always asked so many times, but with a new government, with uh, maybe a resurgence in interest in Australian cinema rather than um, American cinema or Hollywood or whatever, do you think that we do have a good future? Oh, look, I always think our, our future is only as good as our filmmakers. You know, it's, it's finding people who, you know, who want to do different things and have the talent and the expertise to do it. Um, obviously, there's a lot of production now, which is, you know, is, is US-based shooting in Australia, sort of parading as Australian films. But there's always going to be, uh, you know, a, a film that, that gets made against the odds that, that sort of starts a new trend. And that's always going to happen. And that's great to hear. But I'm wondering if there also needs to be a bit of a shake up or changes with Screen Australia, with film financing, Vic Screen, all of those um, bodies, because maybe more projects need to be supported. Yeah, I honestly don't know. Look, I mean, I, I obviously want to make films that aren't very popular in terms of getting financed in Australia. So I, you know, it's it's a it's an uphill battle to some degree for for my projects, but 
you know, once again, with a project like this, you do find that if you can get enough international interest in it, then, you know, you can make it in Australia and still tell, I mean, Girl at the Window is certainly an international story, but we've made it very much as an Australian film. Yeah. And that's great to see. You know, it certainly has a very Australian flavour to it. Yes, uh, absolutely does. So just to conclude, and it's great that uh, Girl at the Window is uh, being released in cinemas in August. Um, have you seen anything else of late that has impressed you? Ah, uh, that's always a question that I always find very difficult to ask, to answer. <laughs> um, I've been watching lots of television lately, actually. Um, yep. Uh, sorry, the, the prequel to Yellowstone, is it 18... 18... 36 or 18, anyway, the Sam Elliott series, I thought oh, yes. was, really, was really, really remarkable. Uh, look, you know, thankfully it's 10 episodes long as opposed to 30. And um, it, it was it was just, um, I, I found it amazing. Okay. Like beautifully acted, beautifully scripted. And um, and uh, yeah, a real, a real kick in the guts too at the same time. Okay, there's a good recommendation. And certainly I recommend uh, that my audience goes to see Girl at the Window uh, when it's released in Australian cinemas on August 18th. And we've been speaking to the director of Girl at the Window, Mark Hartley. Mark, as always, thanks so much for talking with me. Thanks so much, Peter. Bye-bye.